me to Psalm 101. Psalm 101. It's Father's Day. You know, it's interesting. Did you see that? That Father's Day <coughs> was made an official holiday or an official day? Of course, we got an official day for everything in America now. But anyway, it wasn't a, an official day. I think we should protest this, man, until 1972. Nixon signed it in. 1972 on Father's Day. Mother's Day was like a thing for half a century by that time. That just shows how we're beat upon, men. You know, that just that's another example. That's a joke, guys. It's all right. You can laugh a little bit. It's church. We haven't got down to the preaching yet. But anyway, Father's Day. Uh, my father passed away uh, six years ago uh, in 2017. I used to call him on Sunday afternoon. And we'd have a good chat. He lived to be almost 95. And uh, so, but I miss him every day thinking about him today. Psalm 101 in our Bibles this morning. A message to fathers, but will ever, everybody listen in? And it can apply to everybody. It's not just for men, of course. But it is Father's Day. Psalm 101. The Bible says this is a Psalm of David. It says this, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath a high look in a proud heart will not I suffer. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Uh, the foundation of a country, foundation of America, is the churches. We don't really think of that that way. The larger portion of America don't think about it that way, but it's still true. Still a true statement. Uh, it's an indictment on modern day America that Sunday is not an a important day to most people. People out there, I drove by on the interstate, I drove by about 10, 15 guys with big expensive boats going somewhere. You know, I guess he got his Father's Day gift was to go out by himself, all by himself on the boat. But the foundation of a country is the churches. And the foundation of the churches is the men. Absolutely the men. Any good church will be known by the men. Men are supposed to be the leaders. Men are supposed to be the foundation of a good church. Now think about that. Now, we want everybody to be saved. We want to reach men. We want to reach women, children, families. We want to reach everyone. But to me, you can tell, <clears throat> can tell a lot about a church when you look at the men. Now, the truth of it is, any good church could not function one Sunday from the next with all the women that are doing things in the church. When I was pastoring, we had women teaching Sunday school classes. We had men teaching Sunday school classes too, but we had women in the nursery. We, they turned those kids loose. We're done. We're done, friends. We can't, even, we can't even do anything if they turn the nursery kids loose. I'm telling you what, we are done. I can hear them from my pulpit crying in the nursery, so I thank God for the women in the nursery. Junior church, if we're going to have a fellowship, and in the Greek that means food, amen, after the service we need we need the women to bring the fall oh, it just we need everybody but it is interesting that the Bible speaks specifically so many places about the men yeah. about the men take with you, go with me just for a second Ephesians chapter 6 I'm coming right back Ephesians chapter 6 I don't think I'll turn to another verse today until I do turn to another verse and then I'll change my mind but Ephesians 6 in the Bible Ephesians chapter 6 in the Bible, Ephesians 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, 
which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, Ephesians 6, 4, provoke not your children to wrath. The word wrath is an interesting word. <clears throat> appears several times in the King James there. The Greek word there is talking about an explosion of anger. It's like anger building up. And then it explodes. You ever seen that happen? <laughs> I think we've all seen that happen. You know that? We don't want to go to the next question, has it ever happened to us? It is interesting though. He says, verse 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, back in our Bibles, Psalm 101. Psalm 101. Four declarations of David that relate specifically to the fathers, specifically to the men, but they relate to all of us. Ladies, I appreciate if you would still listen today. I mean, it's in the Bible, and while he's speaking to men, and he's giving his own testimony, uh, it applies to all of us as Christians that we want to live for the Lord. You know, I think this, talking about men spiritual men we've got a problem in America yeah. Yeah. we've got a problem in America I can't tell you the statistics I've seen them different times I really should memorize some of them but the number of children in this country that grew up without their father in the house is astronomical the, the numbers are off the charts and you're thinking well that's this type of no 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 that, that's across the board that is across the board I think that personally, I think that calls out for soul winning and bus ministries and all kinds of things where we can minister. Just an aside, when I pastored, I was amazed at how many teenagers came to me and say, would you be like my second dad? And then a lot of times they'd say, really, you could be like my first dad because I don't really have a dad. Sometimes they didn't have a dad actually present. Sometimes they didn't even know who their dad was. Sometimes they hadn't seen their dad for a long time. And other times they just weren't around him very much. You understand what I'm saying. Uh, when I pastored, I used to get all kinds of texts on Father's Day from kids in the church. They'd say to me, Happy Father's Day. Now I got a text from a college kid this morning driving down there. He said, Happy Father's Day. Have a good day. I won't tell you about his father, but he just appreciates... I think everybody appreciates a father figure. You know that? But a good father. So there's four statements that David makes. Now David is making these statements about his own life. He's making a declaration. This would be like a decision at invitation time. This would be like a decision we make to live for the Lord. And we need to make some decisions today. We need to make some decisions to live for the Lord. Now it applies to all of us, but it's Father's Day, so let me just focus in on that, but it applies to all of us. First one is in verse 1. He says, I will sing of mercy and judgment. Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. He makes this simple statement. He says, I will sing. But notice the last part of verse four, verse 1 says this, Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. Now, I don't think he's talking about musical ability. Do you know that? Some people have musical ability. Some people can't carry a tune in a bucket, and some people can't even find the bucket to carry the tune in. You understand? Not a problem. We can all still sing. We should all still sing in the service. But uh, there are some people with just amazing musical ability. I love to hear them sing. But he, I don't think he's talking about musical ability here. I think he's talking about how we live our life and he says, I will sing of mercy and judgment. I, was, I will sing of truth. What is true and what is right. And I will sing it unto thee, O Lord. In other words, I know what's right. I know what's true. And I will declare it. I will give it out. I will give it forth. He says this, unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. Now, uh, so many verses in the Bible, so many verses in the New Testament, Old Testament, that talk about the importance of a father, uh, importance of a husband in the home. 
Uh, and we, we totally understand that. We understand how important that is. And what, it's, what I think is so interesting about verse 1, to me, what he's talking about is not what we sing about in church, but what we sing about all 24 hours. He says, unto thee will I sing. Now, let's just state an obvious fact. There's some people that look pretty spiritual in church, but probably aren't very spiritual outside of church. They know what to do in church. They know how to look. They know how to act. They know when to stand up. They know when to sit down. They know when to leave. They know all of those things. And I understand that. And church is important. But I think what he's talking about in verse 1 is the entire realm of the day. You know? My dad was not a big talker. People say, where'd you get it from? I don't know. But my dad was not a big talker. But when my dad had something to say, you better listen up because it's going to be a long time before he talked again. And when he had something to say, it was worth listening to. But I tell you what, I spent a lot of time with my dad. I was the youngest one uh, in our family. And I spent a lot of time with my dad. And can I just tell you, my dad taught me a lot of things without ever opening his mouth. I was watching my dad all the time. I saw how he interacted with other people. I saw how he dealt with other people. I saw how he handled different situations. And my dad could deal with some situation and he would have the funniest line when he came back. I don't know where he got them from, but man, they were good. My dad's favorite line was when you're around that guy, he says, keep, his, keep your hands in your pocket because otherwise he's going to have his hands in your pocket. I like that one. My dad worked hard for his money. He wasn't giving away to anybody. I like that one. He was just like some guys, he said, they, they're not satisfied until they get that 20 out of your pocket. I like that. You know? Some things are better caught than taught. In other words, our life speaks so loudly, nobody can hear what we're saying. And that's, I think, what David is saying here in verse 1. He says, unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. My entire life is before you, Lord. My entire life is in front of you. And I live with the understanding that you are watching me. You are looking over me. Boy, it's an important lesson, isn't it? We all know that God sees everything. We all know that nothing is hid from the God of heaven, right? We all know that we can say this or do this or uh, deceive this person or try to trick that person, but we don't deceive the God of heaven. He knows everything, right? He says, unto thee... O Lord, will I sing. The first declaration of David in verse 1 is the declaration that I am going to live a life pleasing unto the Lord because He's watching me. He's looking over me. He says, I will sing of mercy and judgment. Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. It's an important declaration. We know David's life. We know his testimony. We know his history. He's far from a perfect man. He's definitely a man with sin. The Bible records his sin accurately. The Bible records everyone's sin accurately. If you or I were writing the account, we'd have probably left some things out. Uh, the same Bible that calls David a man after God's own heart also reveals that obviously at different times he wasn't a man after God's own heart. I think that's where we know it's God's book. God calls it exactly the way it is, doesn't he? Anybody writes their own autobiography, they have a tendency to fudge the truth just a little bit to make themselves look even better. We'd all do the same thing. God doesn't do it that way, does he? David said, unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. A 24-hour life. Notice the second one. It says in verse number 2, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. So the first thing he says, I will sing unto the Lord. The second declaration is in verse 2, I will behave myself. Now he talks about his behavior in verse 2. How do we behave? <laughs> we have, if we have elementary school, we have kids in elementary school, what is their behavior like? That's a good question, isn't it? You know, uh, Parent-teacher uh, conferences. There's just nothing quite like a parent-teacher conference, you know, where that teacher is going to tell you exactly what your child is like. The problem is, our kids are an awful lot like us, aren't they? Right? But he says this, David says, I will behave myself. Hmm. 
my behavior. <clears throat> Does my behavior matter? Does it count? Is it significant? Or can I do, like unfortunately most of people think today, I can do whatever I want to do. I will do whatever I want to do. That's not what David said. That's not what the Bible tells us here. He said, I will behave myself. I want to live in such a way that others will look at me. Now, you know what? I pastored a long time, and I like pastoring. I like preaching and teaching. And uh, I'm at that stage in life where I can see the finish line. I just don't know where it is, you know? Uh, my dad lived to be 95. My grandfather, my dad's dad, lived to be 96. My brothers and I say, I don't know how anybody lives that long. Man, I tell you what, that is a long, long road. Long as I got my brain, and I, I would like to go <laughs> that long. But can I just tell you this? I want to finish strong. Amen. I want to finish well. Yeah. I don't want to limp to the finish line. I don't want to do something now in these years that long after I'm gone will cause my grandchildren to say, well, I guess it doesn't matter. Look what he did. I guess it's not significant. He preached one thing and lived another. Who cares? I don't want to give any fodder. There's enough fodder out there for anybody to not live for the Lord. Our Facebook is full of stuff like that and junk like that. I don't want to buy my life, by my wrong behavior, to give anybody that names me as grandfather, well, I guess that's what he does. Who cares? Now, they're still going to make their own decisions. Uh, they're going to answer to God for their own decisions. But I don't want my wrong behavior to lead anyone astray. It's exactly the same thing David is saying. He said, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. We understand perfect there doesn't mean without sin. It means a mature way, a growing way, a completed way. But he says, I will behave myself wisely. It's just amazing to me how so many people today in the public eye can do the, mo the most ridiculous things and, and justify them. There was a professional basketball player. This is several years ago. All of my illustrations are old because I'm old. It's all right. It works just fine. His name was Gilbert Arenas. And he was played for what they used to call the Washington Bullets. Now they've got a different nickname because bullets made people put bullets in guns and shoot people. You know, that's everybody does that with a sports nickname. They want to go out and do that's ridiculous. But anyway, so they changed the name of it. And so where they were in Washington, D.C., Baltimore area, you couldn't have a gun in the locker room. He took a gun in the locker room and was suspended for an entire season. You know how much money that cost him? Six million dollars. And you're like, how foolish can somebody be? You, you know and I know, if you know sports, that he can't play for the rest of his life. It's not like a regular job. There's a shelf life on that. And why would you behave so recklessly, so foolishly? Here he says, I will behave myself wisely. That's a challenge to me. Do you know that? I will behave myself wisely. In other words, he's talking about his behavior. Not just in church. I, it kind of goes without saying our behavior here should be all right. I mean, I, if we got a problem with that, we got bigger problems than what we think. But I'm talking about in our daily life. I'm talking about in our daily, our daily walk, how we live, how we act. He says, I will behave myself wisely. That's a pretty good challenge. That's a pretty good challenge. Now, Nancy Reagan, when she was first lady, and she was, you know, whatever she was, you know, but she had this thing, and I never understood why, why everybody made fun of it, because it made sense to me, but she had this little phrase, you remember it, some of you other ones, her phrase was what? Just say no. She's talking about drugs and all kinds of things. Well, I hate to be, like, thought of as stupid by this society, but that's the answer. <laughs> Just say no. Now, I understand for some people it's hard to say no. I, un I totally understand that. I get that. And you and I know the Bible teaches that the more you say yes to something, the harder it is to say no to it. You know? 
But it was just such a classic line, and I'm not endorsing everything Nancy Reagan ever said or did. You know, you always got to give a political thing because there was somebody going to talk tell me about Nancy Reagan one time. But anyway, I did love her husband. I thought he was a great president. Yeah. But anyway, I think it's just so classic. You're doing something wrong. You're doing something sinful. You're doing something destructive. Don't do it. Just stop. Just say no. Now, I suspect none of us really struggle with the kind of things that she was talking about when he, she said, just say no. I'm going to just take a guess on that one. But all of us, to be honest, because we still have this sin inside of us, if the Apostle Paul struggled with that at the end of Romans chapter 7, where he said, I'm paraphrasing, the things that I shouldn't do, that's what I do. And the things that I should do, I don't do them. Yeah, the Apostle Paul said that in Romans 7. I suspect that could be true of us as well. And he says, I will behave myself wisely. Behave myself wisely. Uh, I think it's interesting how people are looking at us, Christians, uh, serving the Lord, living for the Lord. I think people are watching us. I, th I think it only makes sense. We say that we believe the Bible, we believe the Word of God, we believe it's uh, truth, we believe it's without error. Then they're going to say, well, what about you? How do you live? And David said this, simple declaration, I will behave myself wisely. I will. What about you? That's a challenge, isn't it? That's hard to do. That's a hard thing to hold up to. So there's the first declaration in verse 1, I will sing. Second one, I will behave. Now verse, the third one, the last part of verse 2, Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? Here's the third declaration. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. So the, first, uh, the second verse starts this way, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Now, I understand that work-a-day world out there can be pretty rough today. I understand that. I understand that this vile world, as the songwriter said, is not a friend of grace. And I understand a lot of places you work, it's a pretty vile world. But notice what he says now, the last part of verse 2, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I've said this statement, I've said it from the pulpit when I was pastoring, I did not know exactly how true it was the Lord was going to impress upon me, but you know what? I don't know what anybody else's house is really like. Do you know that? We really don't. I know what it looks like. Now, I've been in people's houses, people that went to my church. Still, when that door is closed, it's hard to know. Here's what David said. This is a good example for each one of us. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. In other words, he knew it was right. But when he was inside his own house, we would call that downtime, relaxing time, taking it easy time, whatever. But he said, when I was within my own house, I still tried to live the right way. I still tried to do the right thing. It's a pretty good testimony, isn't it? pretty good example. Could I just suggest that it may be true that some people that look like pretty good Christians on Sunday morning in church maybe weren't such a great Christian on Tuesday night at home. I don't think I'm like rocking anybody's rule with that statement. It's not like something I had to spend a lot of time thinking about. I think it's just common sense. You know that? It's just common sense. I don't know really what causes people to go a different direction. I, I don't know. It always bothers me. I was a kid sitting in church, little church in Minnesota, hard-working people, buildings been tore down. You get to live long enough every place you ever went is going to get tore down eventually. Just good people. And I remember just sitting there like in 5th, 6th, 7th grade sitting in our, in our Lucan pew because we had a Lucan pew. No one sat in that thing because we had owned that thing for 20 years. I joke, but you know, we sat in the same pew. I like that world. And I thought, why do so many people that go to this church quit going to this church? Why do kids that grow up in this church 
Why do they not continue? I used to say when I was pastoring, and uh, this doesn't like get you any uh, big bonuses at Christmas, but I said if, if everybody that grew up in this church was still going here, we wouldn't have the building to hold everybody. If, if everybody that, that was in this church, everybody that ever baptized in the baptistry was still coming to this church, and I know people move away. I totally understand that, but you don't understand the point I'm driving at. If they were still coming here, good night, we'd have to have two services in the morning. We'd have to have two services at night. We'd have to do all kinds of things. What happens? Well, I, it's a big question. I don't have the answer to it today, but I do have a partial answer because it's right here in Scripture. He says this, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. You know in that house, nobody sees you but your own family. If somebody has like a severe anger problem, I don't know about it because I'm not in the house. Somebody has a drinking problem, I don't know about it because that's in their house. There's just things, and you and I know this, we know it for a fact, we know it for the truth, I will walk within my house with a perfect eye. The ability of people, all people, people like us, to live a couple different lives is amazing to me. But it's a good testimony. What do we like inside of our own house? What do we like? It's kind of interesting. <laughs> I was at a basketball game. I like going to basketball games. It was at this... Uh, college, it's a university there in Bowling Springs, and they, they play Division One athletics, kind of. You know, it's Gardner Webb University. So there's five girls sitting there watching the game. I'm just watching the game, and there are five girls. They're not watching the game, they're each on their phone. You know what I mean? That, that's just what they're doing. I understand this generation. And so the one girl says, Hey, let's take a picture. So they're, they're all on their phone, and they all look up and they go just like this, right back to their phone. I mean, it was just like the, the smile was for two seconds took a picture, but you know, it was just like, to me it's just kind of like so many people. Got a smile? Right back to where I was at. Got to live for the Lord? Well, I can do that for one hour Sunday morning. But inside your house? That's a different thing, isn't it? Inside my house? That's a different thing, isn't it? I will, third declaration of David, it applies to every single one of us, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Number four is in verse three, and this is a hard one. It says this, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I think he goes on to explain it. He says this, I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Maybe what is the problem with setting wicked things before us is it may lead us astray. Last part of verse 3. Verse 4 says, A froward heart, froward is perverse or twisted, a froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. But it's an interesting statement in verse 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Now that's a huge debate. I can hear all kinds of people speaking and saying different things. It is interesting that it's part of Scripture. Now, David lived a long time ago. David lived before we had 500 TV channels. You know that. David lived before he had a phone in his pocket with the internet on it with all kinds of wickedness on there that people can call up. David lived a long time before there was movies and we had the whole debate of well, should we watch movies and sinful things and people doing sinful things. It is interesting. Could there be, the answer is yes, but could there be a connection between what we see and what we do. I think so. Absolutely, I think so. Let's take something as simple as just telling the truth. We all know you're supposed to tell the truth, and we all know that we live around a bunch of liars. People just lie all the time. We all know not only is honesty the best policy, it's just the right thing to do. But you know, it's just something as simple as that. We have to be careful that we don't start to adopt. Now the truth of it is, <clears throat> a lot of people that lie are very good at it and do quite well because of it. Now, there's a lot of people that couldn't tell the truth if it went looking for them in a dark street. They couldn't, in a dark alley, they couldn't find it. It's a simple thing. But here's interesting. He says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. 
Now, David lived a long time ago. Uh, you and I are just bombarded with wicked things, aren't we? You and I are just bombarded with things that are wrong. If we're not careful, we, we've got to be on guard. David said, I think what he's saying is this, if I observe wicked things, if I'm not careful, it can work its way into my life. In fact, the Bible says, I think exactly what that, it says that the time that kings go forth to battle, David stayed home. I don't know, did David know Bathsheba was going to be there? I don't know. He was in the palace. He could see everything. Wasn't privacy in those days like you and I are so accustomed to. I don't know. Maybe David knew what was coming. But he says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. David, it applies to all fathers, it applies to all men, it applies to all people, it applies to every teenager. If we want to live for the Lord, if we want to please Him, we want to serve Him, we have to do exactly what David did. These four simple declarations. The rest of the psalm just builds on those four simple declarations. <laughs> There's a guy who wrote, uh, wrote some books. I like books. I say I don't like reading near as much as buying them, but I do like buying them, putting them on the shelf, and, and uh, I got all kinds of shelves of books. And Anyway, there's a guy that he's in heaven now, and he traveled and preached for 50, 60 years. Had an earned doctorate, traveled all around the world, taught, preached. He's really more of a teacher than a preacher. I heard him teach one full day on church history. Now, I love history, and the guy was just the kind of guy that he had so much history in him, he wasn't reading enough notes, he just started talking, it just kind of flowed. He was great. Wrote all kinds of books. I got him on my shelf, and I got him sitting in such a way that I just about see him every day. I set him, I got him set in just a little different way. Because when he was in his early 70s, he left his wife and ran off with a younger woman. And he lived his last 10 years in sin. Never going to church. Never preaching again. Never darkening the door. Breaking the, way, the heart of his wife. Embarrassing his children a bad example before his grandchildren. This guy had preached and taught all over the world. And yet when he goes home to die, he's living in sin. I don't understand it. I don't. I can't explain it. I don't know the guy very well. Like I said, I heard him teach one time. I read everything he's ever written. But I know this. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. If you think you're better than that, if you think you're made of sterner stuff than that, I don't think we're reading the scripture accurately. He says this, I will set no wicked thing before mine eye. It's a good statement, isn't it? Four simple declarations by David. It applies to me as a father. Now, my fathering days are different. My kids are all grown. They're on their own. They don't need my help. They need my money every once in a while, but not much of that. Most of them got more money than I do. But anyway, <clears throat> but they're, they're living for the Lord. Of course, that battle isn't finished, you know. They've still got lives to live. They, but uh, I've got some grandchildren, nine grandchildren. The first five are saved. Our, our, our grandson, one of our grandsons got baptized in a good Baptist church just last Sunday night. We saw the video of it. So the first five are saved. The first four have been baptized. Some of the younger ones are just not quite old enough yet. But everything that David said still applies to me today. I don't know where that finish line is, but I know it's out there somewhere. I know it's calling for me. And when I get to that finish line, I want to be just as strong spiritually as I am today. I might have to limp physically to the finish line. Now, some of you may have to drag me across. I don't know. But I hope spiritually, and I pray spiritually, I'm as strong as I am today. I want to go to that finish line. And I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want to give anybody that ever names me as their family member a reason to live in sin. A reason to reject the truth. A reason to go, ah, I tell you what, everybody's just looking for a reason to get off. 
I don't want to. I don't want to supply anything to them. Here it is. I will sing. Verse one. I will behave myself wisely. Verse two. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. And in verse three, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. It applies to every single one of us. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Savannah is going to come. We're going to have just a verse of invitation. God has spoken to your heart. If you'd like to come and pray, or you can pray right here in your seat, but I think it's good for us to just stop and pause and think about it. And you just talk to the Lord. You just get along with the Lord. You say, Lord, here's, here's something you're dealing with me about. You can be honest with the Lord. The Lord knows everything already. As Savannah plays, let's just have a moment of silence meditating on the Word of God. Thank you for today and for the blessing to be in your house today. Thank you for Father's Day, a special remembrance for each father here. We pray you give them a good day, and good remembrances. And Lord, we thank you for this passage from David. A tremendously interesting character from Scripture. Father, I pray that we would take these simple declarations and apply it to our heart, our life, our home. And Lord, that you'd help us to be what you want us to be, dear Lord. Help us to behave ourselves wisely in a perfect way. To be what you want us to be, Lord. Thank you for loving us. And thank you, Lord, that when we fall short, there's always confession and forgiveness, repentance and, and cleansing. And Father, we pray you'd help us to please you and live for you. Lord, thank you for all you've done for us. Lord, give us a good day today as we're with our families. And I pray that you'd bring us back this evening for the evening service. Lord, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.